Excuse me, if I could get everybody to take their seats so we can move on with the program. <laughs> so Matt, sorry to interrupt your conversation, but you're in high demand, I know, so. <laughs> um, Great, so as everybody's uh, sort of filtering back in, uh, it's been a fantastic day. I think we've heard a lot of uh, different perspectives on the energy transition and the challenges that uh, we face, as well as the opportunities that are being presented. Um, I'll have more to say on that uh, 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 when, when, uh, when David's actually done with his presentation. Um, but uh, with that, I'd like to welcome David Daniels to the stage. He's the Chief Energy Modeler at the U.S. Energy Information Administration. Uh, he's going to be talking about the International Energy Outlook, which was just released in Washington last week, I think, right? Uh, so this will be the first formal presentation outside of D.C. Um, uh, I, I, I really enjoy models, not because they provide a precise prediction about what's going to come to pass, but because they make you coalesce lots of different viewpoints and see how they actually interact. Uh, and I think that's actually where the value in modeling is. And so um, I think what you'll, what you'll hear from David is, you know, a lot of the things that you've heard today are things that EIA has been thinking about. Um, and uh, seeing how it all comes together is sometimes remarkable and also very insightful. So with that, David, the floor is yours. Thanks, Ken. I'm gonna, can, am I, yeah, I'm on. I'm gonna stand here and talk uh, partly because I just like walking around and partly to keep myself awake. I don't know what you guys are gonna do to keep yourselves awake. I'm just gonna walk around. Um, I know we're running a little bit short on time here, but the good news is that Ken has already given about half my talk, uh, which was fantastic. Uh, <laughs> Uh, as he said, I'm from the Energy Information Administration. Uh, I'm not going to go through the history. I assume most of you know who EIA is. I was going to introduce ourselves, but I don't think I need to to this audience. We, uh, EIA has a, has a really deep and robust relationship with the Baker Institute. So I want to thank the Baker Institute, uh, Baker Botts, for inviting us to be here. Uh, we, we've worked with Ken for years on uh, uh, global gas issues. Our current administrator, uh, Linda Capuano, comes to us directly from the Baker Institute. Uh, as Ken pointed out, we released this International Energy Outlook last week on Tuesday in D.C. Uh, one of our panelists was uh, Anna Mikulska, who's somewhere in the audience. Hi, Anna. Um, so she's going to see this for the second time in two weeks. I'm sorry about that. Um, so, so uh, you know, we really enjoy that, that relationship. I want to talk about the IEO, but before I get into the results, I want to talk a little bit about, and this is the part that, that Ken's actually kind of already gone through. Um, this is the disclaimer slide. Uh, I find it interesting that I'm giving a disclaimer slide to a room full of lawyers, but here we go. Uh, uh, it's important to understand what the IEO is, and more importantly, what the IEO is not when interpreting the results. Ken mentioned this morning uh, the difference between a projection and a forecast. This is a projection. It's not a forecast. Let me tell you the difference between those two things. Both projections and, and forecasts have a lot of uncertainty, right? We, we make a prediction of what's going to happen in the future. We could be wrong. It could be higher. It could be lower. Projections and forecasts both suffer from that same fate. We're going to be wrong. It's going to be different from the way we think it's going to be. That's not the difference between a projection and a forecast. A forecast is somebody's best guess about the way things are likely to change. How, this is how we think it's going to evolve. You can argue with it, but it's what somebody believes is going to happen. A projection is not. EIA is really sure that what we pro project in here is not going to happen. It is wrong. <laughs> Right? We know it's wrong. It's biased. We know where the bias is. I'm going to let you in on the secret. I'm going to show you where the bias is. I'll let you know where it is. Uh, it's important for you to understand because uh, unlike a, a standard uh, uh, investment disclaimer that says, you know, don't make any investment decisions based on this, ironically, because we're charging you to buy it to make investment decisions. Uh, this one's biased, um, and not just the uncertainty, but we make two uh, assertions, assumptions, but therefore they're assertions, about the way the world evolves that are just wrong. Uh, the, the two assumptions are, first, there are no technology revolutions between now and 2050. No structural breaks, no technology breakthroughs. Sure, technology continues to evolve, prices get cheaper, technology continues to improve, but no, no breakthroughs, no dilithium crystals, right? Uh, the second one is current laws and uh, regulations. Current laws and regulations, as written on the books, stay as written on the books. Nothing ever changes. No new laws, no new regulations. How many people believe that's going to happen? <laughs> right, EIA doesn't believe that either. Uh, we're absolutely sure that is not going to happen. The U.S. Congress is not going to take no action between now and 2050 that has any impact on the, on, the, on the energy system. So why in the world do we do this? Uh, it's ridiculous, right? Uh, we, we do it because we're not trying to produce a forecast of the future. We're not trying to predict what's going to happen. We do it because we're trying to produce a baseline, a baseline against which to measure change, the impact of action. 
Well, you can't measure the impact of action unless you have a baseline against which to measure it. So we are producing a baseline. This is the no change, no action baseline. Um, we do it because our, our, our fundamental customer is Congress. Uh, it's a decision maker. They have the power to change the nature of the energy system itself. If you're an investor, you're essentially a price taker. You're not going to change the, the, the system with your investment, probably, depending on how big an investor you are. Um, but you're not likely to change the system itself. So you need a forecast in order to make an investment decision. You're not going to get that from EIA. Please don't make any investment decisions based on this. It will be wrong. You will lose your shirt. Um, I can guarantee you'll lose your shirt. Well, no, I can't, because then you could hedge against that, and then, okay, don't take this as investment advice. Um, uh, we do it for Congress. Congress needs to have that no change baseline. Then we can put in the changed baseline. What are you thinking about doing? Okay, well, we can put that in our model. We can get another case, a side case, that has that change in it. Now we can do the delta analysis. When well, you know what that delta is? That delta is the impact of the change, the impact of the action. That's why we do it. We do it to serve our customer, which is Congress. Okay, so after just having convinced you in the first five minutes of this talk that everything else I'm going to show you is wrong, why should you stay here and listen to me? <laughs> I'm sure I should answer that, shouldn't I? Um, okay, uh, so just like the old George Box quote that all models are wrong but some are useful, all outlooks are wrong. Whether they believe they are forecasts or projections, they are always wrong, but some are useful. Some provide insights. I hope this provides insights. So I'm going to share some of the insights from the IEO 2019 with you. Um, I'm not going to go through our, 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 our cases. I'm going to talk about the reference case, which is that baseline assumption. We also produce side cases that vary some of the assumptions, that highlight some of those uncertainties. We vary the economic growth assumptions up and down. We vary the oil prices up and down to see how things change. I'm not going to go through most of that. I'm going to show you one slide just to prove that we actually do it, uh, but I'm not going to, not going to highlight that. Uh, Instead, I'm going to show you the, the, the five sort of main insights that I want to highlight. The, the, these aren't rocket science, but these are the insights that come out of this current, uh, current IEO. They're a little bit different from things we said earlier. The five insights are the following. Manufacturing centers are changing. We've always known they're changing. They're changing location. They've always been moving to China. It's not that they're not continuing to move to China. It's that they're, they're diversifying where they move to. This, China's not shrinking. But the manufacturing centers are also moving to uh, South Asia, in, especially India. And it's moving to Africa, especially in the out years, close to 2050. Um, that has interesting implications, not just for the growth of energy consumption, but for the type of energy that's consumed uh, and for trade patterns. Oh, backwards. Um, manufacturing is changing. Natural gas and petroleum uh, 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 demand is increasing dramatically in Asia. That shouldn't surprise anyone. The supply is not dramatically increasing in Asia. And therefore, trade patterns are changing. Whenever we have dramatic change, uh, trade patterns in any commodity, in anywhere in the world, that usually is accompanied with all kinds of other really interesting geopolitical issues. I am not going to talk about any of those things, but there are many people in this room that probably could. Uh, I'm simply going to highlight the changing trade uh, patterns. Uh, end use consumption is increasingly shifting toward electricity. This has been talked about a lot today already. Um, that has caused that, along with falling uh, prices for renewable, uh, technologies, as well as a relatively supportive policy environment in many parts of the world, means that the nature of the electricity system, the generating system in, uh, in the world is changing. Uh, renewables are growing dramatically. By the end of, by 2050, renewables is the number one source of energy consumption in, in the IEO. And yet, the last point, even though their renewables are growing dramatically, uh, we don't see a peak in anything. Uh, no fuel peaks. Uh, and therefore, emissions, carbon dioxide emissions from the energy sector does not peak. It continues to grow throughout the, uh, throughout the, present, throughout the uh, projection. Okay, those are the five main, main points I wanted to highlight. Uh, here's some data. This is an easy one. This is a softball, right? Energy is growing. Energy consumption in the world increasing about 50% from 2018 to 2050. I'm going to show you the same data three different times. So this is the easy one. This is the harder one. It's the same data. I've now split it between OECD and non-OECD. OECD is not growing very fast. This will be a recurrent theme over and over throughout this presentation. It's the one on the bottom. Left and right are exactly the same data. The only difference is that those little, it's not your eyes, there really are three different lines in there. This is the only time I show any, I'm showing any side cases. The ones on the left are the side cases where we vary the economic growth assumptions. The one on the, on the left, the one on the right is where we vary the oil price assumptions. Uh, the only point in this is that the, uh, the growth is higher in the, in the non-OECD and also the uncertainty in that growth is also higher in the non-OECD. So all the interesting things are happening in the non-OECD. OECD, the developed world, is essentially not very interesting. This is the same data now broken by region. We have 16 regions in our model, so you'll see the same regions show up and over and over again, and I, and I split them up in slightly different ways each time. Uh, but the main point here is that the, the location of that growth is, in fact, Asia, which shouldn't surprise anyone. 
so consumption is growing in Asia. Why? It's growing in Asia because of our input assumptions. These are our input assumptions about economic growth. Uh, OECD on the left-hand side, uh, average GDP growth rate for the whole world in, our, in, in this outlook is about 3%. OECD is growing about 1.5%. One, one uh, there is no, con no region in the OECD that's growing faster than 2.5%. The non-OECD is growing at a little more than 3.5%, and you'll see four outliers on the right-hand side. Those four outliers are China, unsurprisingly, India, unsurprisingly, what we call rest of non-OECD Asia, which is EIA euphemism for Southeast Asia, and, uh, and Africa. Those four regions are growing faster than any, any other region in the, in the model. Uh, those are our input assumptions. And interestingly, two-thirds of the world's population are in those four regions. So there's an outlier economic growth coupled with most of the world's population. That combination leads to more energy consumption. There's, it's really hard to get around that, that fact. Uh, right, so where is, that, where is the energy consumption happening? Uh, by sector, on the left-hand side, it's happening in the industrial sector. Interestingly, industrial is about twice as big as transportation. Transportation is about twice as big as commercial. Commercial is about twice as big as residential. I did not make those numbers up. That's just what came out of the model. Um, it's just an interesting, interesting fact. So most of it's in, resident, in industrial, and the growth is mostly in industrial. On the right-hand side is breaking down the industrial consumption by subsector. So non-manufacturing, non-energy intensive manufacturing, and then that energy intensive manufacturing. Yeah, it's that energy intensive manufacturing, unsurprisingly, where the most of the energy growth is. That's the iron and steel, that's aluminum, that's uh, refining, in fact, right? Uh, pulp and paper, the, the, the really ha uh, heavy energy intensive, intensive uh, manufacturing centers. And the reason I highlight that is because it's the location of that sector that's changing. So this is now the share of that energy intensive manufacturing in the world uh, by select regions. The four regions that I highlighted before that have that high economic growth, those are the four at the top. India, other non-OCD Asia, Africa, and China. I've lumped everything else into the rest of the world, but it's mostly OECD. Uh, uh, the shares are basically maintaining their shares, except for India and rest of the world. So it's not directly that the rest of the world is giving up their energy intensive manufacturing and sending it to India, but net net that's what's happening. Now the share, the overall growth is still growing, so China's still growing. All these sectors are still growing, but the share is, is, is shifting toward India, which I think is uh, pretty interesting. So, uh, uh, and interestingly, the reason I highlight that energy intensive manufacturing is because uh, unless something happens, unless change is taken, unless a technology revolution happens, unless a policy changes, unless something changes, the mix of energy in that energy intensive manufacturing doesn't change very much. It's hard to affect that mix. Um, this is that mix of that energy intensive manufacturing sector. The OECD on the left, uh, non-OECD on the right. Non-OECD is, is much more heavily weighted toward coal. OECD is much more heavily weighted toward gas and, and, and liquids, actually. Gas and, uh, yeah, gas and liquids. There is some electricity, but not very much. And electricity doesn't come in very much in that sector. This is a relatively big challenge for people that want to decarbonize. We're not trying to decarbonize at EIA. We're trying to project. We're saying this is what would happen if no, if no, if no change happened. Um, but, but this represents a challenge for people that want to decarbonize or want to electrify. And we've talked about this today as well. Okay, so that's uh, industrial. Let's switch to transportation. Transportation in our uh, outlook continues to be driven by liquid fuels. Uh, there is some electrification, there is some switching toward gas, but it's still, at the end of the projection period, 2050, still driven by liquid fuels, gasoline, diesel. Now, their growth starts to slow in gasoline and diesel due to efficiency gains, essentially, uh, but they're still growing. They're not peaking, they're not coming down. Jet fuel, jet fuel is growing. Jet fuel is growing in the OECD. There are very few plots that I'm going to show today where anything grows on the left-hand side. This is one of them. Jet fuel grows in the OECD. Also grows in the non-OECD as air, air travel uh, picks up. So jet fuel is an area of growth. Um, so if the transportation sector, which is the primary consumer of liquid fuels, stays dominated by liquid fuels, let's look at liquid fuels now uh, across, uh, not just in the transportation sector, across all sectors, across regions. What you see here is, unsurprisingly, the largest growers of liquid fuels are non-OECD China, India, other non-OECD Asia, throw in Middle East for good measure in Africa. The, this is significant because this is the source of demand. If you look at the sources of supply, what you'll find on the left hand, right hand side is that that slice labeled non-OECD uh, Asia, labeled Asia, but it is non-OECD Asia, doesn't grow. So, to my point that I made earlier, demand is growing in Asia, supply is not growing in Asia. That leads to an obvious change in uh, trade flows, right? There's going to be a big 
uh, uh, imports of, of, of liquid fuels into, into, uh, into Asia. So that's like the obvious solution. Now, I, I, I kind of pulled a fast one on you when I did that. Because when I went from the previous chart to this chart, this was demand, and it was demand of liquid fuels. Liquid fuels are things like gasoline and diesel. This was supply, and it was supply of petroleum. Not quite the same thing. Because in between petroleum and liquid fuels is this big thing called refining. And I didn't talk about where refining went. And I didn't talk about it because I don't know. But that's a really big question. Where does refining go? Um, it's, an, it's a question that's an open question that we're continuing to investigate. But the nature of the trade we know is going to change. What we don't know is the nature of the refining, right? Uh, do, does, the, does the trade in crude oil change? Does the trade in refined products change? Do both change? Uh, that's an open question, but it's a question for, uh, certainly for investigation. Uh, okay, so that is uh, oil. The natural gas story looks very similar. The sources of demand for natural gas are Asia. The sources of supply are not growing in Asia, and therefore you have the same kind of uh, trade flows in natural gas. We had a lot of discussion about that in the previous uh, panel, so I'm not going to go into too much detail there, except to show, to point out uh, the, the actual changes in trade flows. This is net trade in natural gas, uh, net imports, right? So going up is imports, going down is exports. Uh, net, uh, the big importer currently is OECD Europe. They continue to be a big importer, continue to import more. Uh, the big exporters continue to be exporters. Europe and Eurasia is essentially Russia. Uh, Middle East continues to export Americas. This is the U.S. Pre predominantly continues to export. The big importer gain is obviously non-OECD Asia. Uh, they're a relatively minor importer now. They become the largest importer in the world by 2050. Uh, again, changing trade flows lead to really interesting uh, implications. Uh, electricity. Let's change, change gears to electricity. Electricity is growing, again, growing faster in non-OECD than OECD. This shouldn't change. It shouldn't surprise anyone. The sector where it's growing, the, it's growing in all sectors, but the sector where it's really taking off is residential. It's due to electrification in all of its forms. So if you look, if we then do a deep dive into residential energy consumption, this is all electricity. If we now do a deep dive into residential, we see that residential energy consumption is essentially flat in the OECD, OECD across all fuels. It's kind of flat in the non-OECD, too. I mean, natural gas is growing a little bit, but the big growth is non-OECD electricity. So residential sector is growing, and what's growing is electricity and non-OECD. Uh, that growth leads to a shift in the, um, in the uh, nature of the generation, right? So because of the low cost and continuing to decrease cost in renewables, because of favorable policy environments, a lot of that growth in the generation comes from renewables. On the, on the right-hand side, I'm going to brief this backwards. The right-hand slide is showing share of generation. You can see the share of renewables on the top is growing, the share of nuclear and liquids Sorry, liquids is zero. The share of coal and nuclear, you can't even see the colors, but the two at the bottom are coal and nuclear. Uh, those are decreasing. Gas is kind of holding its own. Because of the increasing of the, of the tremendous growth in electricity, gas, absolute value of gas is increasing, but its share is sort of maintaining its, uh, maintaining its share. Renewables growing share in a fast growing market, right? If anyone been to, went to business school, this is the old uh, BCG two by two growth share matrix, right? That's a star, right? So renewables is the star here. Uh, that's what we're saying. Uh, this just highlights that same issue. In the, in the OECD, this is the load growth, relatively low load growth in the OECD, and all of that load growth is taken up by renewables. In fact, they displace some of the non-renewables. But in the non-OECD, the load growth is so high that even with the declining costs, even with the policies pushing renewables in, even with all the renewables that the system can take, it still has, can you even see it? non-renewables. There's a non-renewables uh, uh, wedge that comes in as well. So that's the, the big difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side is just the slope of the line, how fast the load is growing. Uh, I'll illustrate that with two more examples, uh, kind of a compare and contrast. Two regions that both have supportive uh, renewables policies. Uh, the big difference is, the, is the, um, the load growth, essentially. First one's India. This is India. Uh, total generation growth on the left-hand left side, shares on the right-hand side. They start with a share of about 70% coal. The coal share declines to 40%, uh, and that share is essentially taken up by renewables. Renewables start from kind of negligible, they end up with over half renewables by 2050 in India. India ends up with over half renewables, uh, intermittent renewables, uh, solar and wind. That's tremendous, and it's in a, in a fast growing market. But because the market is so fast growing, even though coal is losing share, it's still growing. Coal still grows on the left-hand side. The absolute value of coal, still, they're still adding more coal capacity or generation. <clears throat> uh, it's just that renewables can't grow that fast. It just can't grow that fast. It's growing as fast as it can. It's taking over. Uh, but coal still grows in India. 
uh, compare that, contrast that with OECD Europe. OECD Europe also has favorable policies. Renewables are also coming in. Renewables also end up over 50% by 2050. Uh, but since the growth isn't so high, they're stealing not just share, but absolute from, from coal, essentially. So coal is really kind of driven out of, out of Europe in our, in our uh, projections. Uh, so this is kind of a summary chart uh, of demand. The difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side, left-hand side is primary energy, right-hand side is, is uh, end-use uh, uh, demand, and really the difference there is that we've taken the electricity line on the right-hand side, split it into its constituent parts on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you see that electricity is growing faster than any other end-use fuel. That should be unsurprising at this point. On the right-hand side, because the nature of that electricity is so heavily geared toward renewables, you see renewables growing faster. I'm going to grab water somewhere. Here's water. That'll work. Renewables are taking off. They are, they are growing much faster than anybody else. They're taking over from, uh, in fact, petroleum uh, as the number one uh, fuel uh, used in the primary energy. Excuse me. Um, there's one other, two other points to note in this. Uh, one is that nobody is peaking. There's no fuel in here that peaks anywhere in our projection. There is a peak in history in coal, uh, and then it continues to come down, has a shallow bowl, and then continues to increase in the out years. Uh, why? Just because of our economic uh, growth assumptions. There is just a lot of demand. Um, the other interesting thing, which I can't explain, is that bizarre triple point on the left-hand side in 2030. I have no idea what happens in 2030, but they all magically convene. <laughs> It's just the way it turned out. Uh, uh, so that's kind of a summary. And then as a result of that non-peaking uh, emissions, carbon dioxide emissions, this is not full greenhouse gas emissions, it's only carbon dioxide emissions, and it's only from the energy sector, from combustion in the energy sector specifically, uh, continue to increase throughout the projection period. Now, the location of that increase is not the United States. It's not the rest of OECD. It's not even China. It's India and the rest of the non-OECD. That's where the increase is coming from in our projections. So again, this is the no action projection. So if you don't like this world, do something about it, right? Take some action. But this is what we're saying. If, if no action were taken, this is the way the energy system would evolve. So again, I'm just reiterating, uh, these are the five points that I wanted to highlight today. Um, Manufacturing centers are changing. Oil and gas trade is changing. The world is electrifying. The electricity is being generated predominantly by renewables. And even though renewables come in like gangbusters, emissions still increase. If we still have time, I'm happy to take questions. Great. Yeah. Um, I'll invite people up to the... <clears throat> all, all of this is uh, published on our website, by the way. Uh, not necessarily all of these slides, but all of the data that was behind these slides, it's all published on our website. It was there last Tuesday. So I got to say, I, I love it um, when David actually does a presentation because it comes at you so fast. It's sort of like drinking water from a fire hose. Uh, hopefully you guys have some questions. Uh, so if you do, please come up to the aisle and uh, uh, take the mic and we'll call on you. Dan. Okay. Thanks, Dan Cohan from Rice. Um, yeah, Equinor, BP, Shell, um, IEO, uh, IEA all do projections that take the Paris Agreement into account. Um, why doesn't EIA, and who would have the authority to, ch to change that? Is that you or the administrator or Congress? That's a really good question. Um, we take current laws and regulations. Which of the Paris promises are current laws and regulations? Those that are, we take into account. Those that are not, we take as aspirational statements. Uh, we have a long history of doing that. We do it within the U.S. We do it outside the U.S. philosophically. It's a lot harder to do that outside the U.S. Inside the U.S., we're a rule of law state. It's a country. It's a, it's a relatively easy, straightforward exercise to look and see what's on the books. It's pretty, pretty, pretty obvious. Final rule, it's in. If it's not a final rule, it's not in, except for unfunded mandates. If it's an unfunded mandate, it's not a binding constraint in our model. That's in the U.S. Outside the U.S., what's a law? That's a really interesting question. I mean, this is the right room to ask that question. What's a law in India? So they have a five-year plan. Is that a law? China has a five-year plan. Is it a law? So what we end up doing, it's hard. It's really hard. Um, it's also complicated. So what we end up doing is we basically look at historical precedent. We will look country by country at the laws and regulations that they actually, we actually look at the policies. We look at their aspirational statements. And then we say, have those aspirational statements historically turned into laws? Have they been, have they been in good indicators of future laws? Or have they not been? 
And so we, we sort of look country by country. Because in China, if you literally only took what was written on the books, you would have nothing after two years from now. There would be nothing. There was no environment. They have five-year plans. They get around to implementing those plans in law two or three years into the five-year plan. And those laws go for the next couple of years before they have another five-year plan. But the five-year plans are as good as law. They indicate every single time they say something, they're going to do something. They always do it. So that's a different environment from a legal standpoint. What should we assume? We assume that if it's in the five-year plan in China, it'll probably happen. They have a good track record of doing that. We have to do that on a country-by-country -country basis. Philosophically, we're doing current laws and regulations. How that works out, there's a lot of analyst judgment in that. And the question of... How would we change was, it? How, who has the authority to say... The administrator. Talk to Linda. She has the authority. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Well, I mean, also, Congress can request scenarios. Right, so, so that's, our, that's our reference case. What I just yeah. described is our reference case. Our reference case and the side cases that we normally produce. When Congress comes to us and says, could you please run the following thing? Yeah, mm -hmm. sure, absolutely happy to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, as long as we can. Okay. Uh, but if the they request a special request, then we'll a do a side case on that. Yeah, absolutely. With the NDCs from each country. Um, they have never asked us to do that. Let's go over here. Frank Elvin, Bel Air, Texas. Um, do your projections for CO2 from fossil fuels, do they include um, CO2 from cement manufacturing and CO2 from flaring, such as from the Permian Basin? Um, not from the first. Sorry? Not from the first. And I believe no, not, not from cement. the second. Not from cement, right. And I believe, but I'd have to check this actually, that it doesn't include flaring either. I don't know that for sure. I need to check. Um, that's, that's actually a good question that I don't know the answer to. Uh, basically what we do is we look at energy consumption, and this is why I don't know whether flaring is accounted for. I know we count for flaring. What I don't know is when it, whether in our CO2 calculations we add that line into the consumption line before we multiply it by the emissions factor. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but philosophically, what we're looking at is energy, cons energy uh, from fossil fuel combustion in the energy sector multiplied by emissions factors. Mm -hmm. So it's only CO2, only CO2, not greenhouse gases, not, there's no methane. Um, no, not, I mean, we track NOx and SOx, but we don't. <clears throat> uh, so only CO2 from combustion in energy sectors. Right. Okay, let's go here. Yes, following up on uh, Michael Scott in Houston and Madrid. Um, following up on the prior question, Madrid, from the awesome. prior question, uh, are the Paris Accords then just a fantasy? Are they current laws and regulations? Well, I mean, you, you're sitting, the one that's sitting in the chair analyzing. I mean, I mean is this all, well, I'm not going to use the word I want to use, but is this all nonsense or simply imagination of, of people that, would, that have very nice ideas, but really the implementation is a fantasy? No, that's not what we're talking about. That's actually, not, that's oh. actually it's a great question because yeah. it's not even how we think. Okay. Um, that's not even, doesn't even cross our minds. What crosses our minds is, is there additional action that needs to be taken? I went to graduate school in physics. Yeah. And I barely got through. I remember a class called Relativistic Quantum Mechanics. I remember the name of it. I, I know what relativity is. It's hard. I know what yeah. quantum mechanics is. That's also hard. Yeah. When you put the two together, It's wow. really hard. <laughs> wow. Right? Now, I got through that class on partial credit. Thank goodness for partial credit. Right? Yeah. Never would have made it through without partial credit. Here's the difference. At EIA, yeah. we don't give partial credit. You've got to actually finish the action before we give you any credit for having started the action. Right. Right? So uh, for those Paris Accords, most of which were aspir aspirational targets, mm -hmm. the U.S. absolutely was an aspirational target, right? We, we're going to do, we're going to, we commit to taking future action that will result in the following. Right. That's a great statement. Until you take the future action, you get no credit for having an aspiration. But, but when you guys do your analysis, do you think they're going to do it or do you think they're not going to do it? I guess that's We why. wait for them to do it. You wait, okay. Right? Because we're trying uh -huh. to provide a baseline so they can measure the progress. Okay, I see. Right? The other way to think about it is we're providing this, this service for, let's say, the U.S. Congress. It doesn't do them any value if we try to anticipate what they're going to do. How does that help them? If I'm a waiter, yeah. how does it help me to try to guess what you're going to go eat and go make it in the kitchen? No, <laughs> I go ask you what you want to eat. I don't do anything until you tell me what you want to eat. I uh, now, I if now, if you're running the restaurant, you have to guess what your customers are going to mm -hmm. eat because you've got to buy the food. If you're <clears> investing... You've got to guess what Congress is going to do because you've got to invest into that environment. Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to talk to Congress, you've got to take their action out 
So you can tell them what would happen if they did nothing. I see. That's what we're trying to do philosophically. Thank I think, David, it might be worth just, you know, maybe 30 seconds on what the remit of EIA is and why you'd actually impose policy in your forecast. Uh, uh, right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 30 seconds, huh? Well, that's well a challenge. <laughs> I'll give you a little more. <laughs> um, so, so EIA was stood up in the 70s as a response to the oil crisis. Uh, Congress recognized that they needed a, an analytic capability. They stood up EIA, actually FEA, Federal Energy Agency at the time, became EIA. And, and, the, and our, our mandate was to remain independent, independent from Congress itself. That's a really insightful thing for the US Congress to do, and an extraordinarily rare thing for them to do for them to recognize that they needed help and to give up their own authority to another agent, to another organization. So they gave their own authority to EIA and said, you go off on your own and do good work and tell us how the system is gonna evolve and don't report to anybody. EIA has two gigantic blank checks, two gigantic blank checks that were put in the statutory uh, laws that set it up in the, in, in the 70s. Uh, the first was that it can collect any information from any organization, I'm saying this fast, but listen carefully, any information from any organization that does any business in the United States about energy, full stop. That's a gigantic blank check, <laughs> right? Um, that's the authority that we use to collect information in our surveys. It's always at the bottom in a little footnote. Oh, by the way, you have to provide this information or else. It's never been challenged in court. Um, why? Because we always protect information. Um, uh, I used to work as a management consultant. I would cold call people without any authority whatsoever and ask them for, for private in information. They would often give it to me because I promised to give them back something of value. We do the same thing at EIA. We're going to anonymize your information. We'll keep your, your, your uh, information uh, secure, and we'll provide you back with something, something valuable. We also have a big stick, so it works really well. Um, that's the blank check number one. Blank check number two is that the, the administrator of EIA, Linda Capuano, once she has been Senate confirmed, is allowed to release any report uh, that she would like without any revision, without any review from any other employee of the federal government. The last I checked, every secretary was an employee of the federal government. The president himself is an employee of the federal government. She does not need anyone's review before she releases this document. So she didn't get any review before she released this last Tuesday. Um, she very often gives a courtesy briefing to you know, other people in DOE so they know what she's going to say, but they don't get veto power. Uh, that's another gigantic line check. So that maintains EIA's independence. That's how we do it. Uh, and, and, and every administrator from the beginning of the, of the organization through to including Linda has, has guarded that uh, uh, responsibility. Thanks. Hi, my name is Steve Krebs. I'm from Clean Chair here in Houston. Okay. Have you done some sensitivities about different pricing scenarios of, of carbon? And if, if you have, could you share us oh. what the impact would be on um, fuel sources? Yeah, we, we do um, uh, routinely, um, certainly internally mostly as diagnostics for the model, but occasionally we will publish them. Uh, we haven't done any with this international energy outlook, but with our annual energy outlook, the one that focuses on the US, we have published uh, carbon cases in the past. Um, I think the last one we did was two years ago, so it would have been the AEO 20, 1918, 17. It would have been AEO 2017. We published one, it was hidden in a uh, special report that we did as a follow-on to the AEO that was focusing on nuclear. You would never guess that that's what the carbon price case was. But there's a carbon price buried in the nuclear report that came out of the result of the AEO 2017. If you can't find it, send me an email, I'll let you know where it is. Um, uh, but yeah, we routinely run these things. They give results that you'd expect. Um, you know, you drive up the price of carbon, uh, coal falls out, petroleum gets impacted, gas eventually comes out, but coal first, coal goes out first. Coal never leaves until you get to really, really, really high carbon prices. It never leaves the U.S. Um, uh, our representation of plants is done at the individual plant level. There are some captive coal plants that are sitting next to a mine mouth. They're not going to shut down. Uh, we know about them. Uh, it, and when you shut down, when you drive the price of carbon up, uh, you're shutting down coal facilities, but you're shutting down the dogs. And what's left over are the more efficient ones. The remaining fleet ends up actually more efficient than it was before. And in fact, that remaining fleet runs at higher capacity factors. That makes them even more efficient. So there's this really weird feedback loop. All of that's in the model. Of course, that feedback loop can be overcome at a high enough carbon price. But yes, we run them. Sort answer is yes. Should have taken a line from, from uh, Tristan. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Mike Sloan with Virtus Energy. Um, and I've worked a lot with EIA data. I've got a research company. 
over the last few decades, but uh, I was surprised at a, a couple of slides. And admittedly, you had a super fat caveat at the beginning that this was going to be extrapolomania. You know, it's <laughs> what we're going to be looking at. But um, on the transportation slide, yeah. by 2050, uh -huh. I think it's still 95% oil and gas. <clears throat> That's right. That's about 5% electricity is it. There's zero hydrogen in there. Is that correct? Yeah, we have no hydrogen. No hydrogen at all. At all. And even like 15%, I think, is natural gas, mm -hmm. roughly. A lot of natural gas. Uh, and then just like a couple slides back where you showed overall what's going on. I think petroleum was like one of the fastest growing ones. Mm -hmm. And I want to loop that back to transportation because, <coughs> yeah, that one I think it was. I'll get there eventually. All right. Yeah, it was just uh, two back. You've already passed the one that I was going to refer to next. That's the petroleum one you're talking about. That, that's the one, yeah, on the right-hand side yep. where, you know, it's, it, it, there's very little electricity, no hydrogen, quite a bit of natural gas, and then traditional fuels. Right. But then all the way at the other end of the presentation, I think two from the end, uh -huh. it shows the overall growth in petroleum. And I just want to ask you what cost assumptions are embedded in there. Because yep. if you just look today, right, I mean, oil, uh, petroleum, is about 4x higher than natural gas, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, there's a cost incentive to try to use natural gas instead Absolutely. of oil for transportation. But electricity... Oil for... Say that last the, part, in the last transportation word. sector. Why I mean, is there an incentive to use uh, natural gas instead of oil a, in the transportation sector? It's a sector? cheaper fuel. Uh -huh. and it's just energy, fundamentally a cheaper fuel. And the energy density is what, again? <laughs> there's incentive to find technologies to use it. And it's uh, obviously it's in there because it goes up and to 15%. is that technology existing today? Percent. Well, it already shows, I think you have about 5% of transportation coming from natural gas. Uh -huh. So I presume it does. So uh, in the, but in I want to do ask about electricity, because electricity today as a fuel is probably what? About one third or one fourth the cost of a fuel to fuel an EV as opposed to <clears throat> internal combustion engine. Right. So the EV question is a good one. Uh, we have a lot of EVs coming in. It's a lot more than it looks like in that little sliver. That little sliver was energy consumption. It's final energy consumption. So right there, you're taking a one-third hit on EVs. One-third. Also, you're seeing the consumption of the fleet. Sales by 2050 are 30, 40, 50%. I can't remember exact, the exact number, but sales of EVs in the light-duty vehicle fleet are relatively high. They, haven't, they don't dominate. Uh, light-duty vehicles across the world are still dominated by liquid fuels. But, but EVs are coming in pretty dramatically toward, toward the end. It takes a while for them to per percolate into the fleet. It's another 10 years, 10 or 15 years for them to get into the fleet. So they're increasing, but they haven't increased enough to, to show up that much. Second thing is light-duty vehicles isn't that much of transportation, and it's not growing. Uh, what's growing is air travel. What's growing is freight, and those are really hard to electrify. Shipping, it's really hard to make an electric boat. It's really hard to make a renewables boat. If only we could make a boat that could run on wind or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of the point. <laughs> um, your other point about technologies that could happen. Absolutely, they could happen. We're watching all the technology developments. We live in a building with people that are <clears throat> desperately pushing programs, billion dollar programs to push the super truck. We, we, we tour the super truck. We go sit in the super truck. We look at the, we, we, we know about the developments that the DOE is pushing. We see them until they're demonstrated at commercial scale. They, we don't get, they don't get partial credit until they come in as a viable technology. They don't get, they don't get credit. Okay, so they just won't show up even by 2050 with the assumptions you're using. With the assumptions we, we put in, right. Okay, thank right. you. So David, That's I have it. a question um, for you. Uh, oh, I know with NEMS, ones, I know with NEMS yeah. you know, it's actually accessible by the general public. It you is. can actually you know, download the model and actually run all kinds of scenarios. You, you may. I don't know whether you can or not. You probably can, but very few others probably can. Well, point is, um, I know... Uh, WEPS. Yeah, WEPS. World Energy it. Projection is, System. Is the same thing true? That, it is true. You can download it. Again. In fact, I didn't talk about this, but as Chief <clears throat> Energy Modeler, what I'm most proud of in the IEO 2019 is we have two gigantic new modules in WEPS. We developed uh, what we call the Global Hydrocarbon Supply Model. Oil and gas upstream and midstream. Think about that. We just developed a model of oil and gas upstream and midstream. That was pretty cool. That was really hard. <laughs> um, we, just built, we developed that. We haven't gotten the bugs all worked out about it, about it, and that's why I can't talk too much about refining. 
but that's why I want to do it. I want to see what happens to refining. I'm excited about that new model. We also developed a, a global electricity model, which is much better than, uh, than what we had in there before. So we're developing these things. And yeah, they are in principle available. If you uh, want to get a copy of it and run it yourself, you in yeah. principle. I mean, I, I just raise that point because there's a lot of questions about you know, technology assumptions and making yeah. different. Yeah. It, and you know, other groups have actually done that. Right and reported in, in things like Energy Modeling Forum yep. and whatnot. So it's doable um, if you want to see them. But you know, EIA has a very specific remit, um, and you don't really make assumptions about what policies forthcoming unless you're asked to. That's right. right. So, so all all these projections you have, what is the cone of uncertainty around these uh, uh, projections? Okay. <coughs> I was trying really hard to avoid the uncertainty question. <laughs> I almost got there. Um, but since you asked, I'll answer it. Uh, it's a really good question. Here's the, here's the short answer, and it's a short answer that only applies to wonks. I'm assuming that you guys are wonky enough to understand the answer. In our reference case, there are ginormous uncertainties. Ginormous and unspecified. We never try to quantify them because it's simply too hard. Uh, there's, you know, 100,000 inputs. How would we vary them all with some kind of a Bayesian probability distribution? The thing takes 12 hours to run. How many of these runs can we possibly do? It's an intractable problem. However, uh, we don't care. <laughs> and we don't care because that's not our job. What our job is to just figure out the impact of a change. When you do the impact of a change, you run a side case. In the side case, you also have ginormous uncertainties. But you know what? They're all highly correlated. When you take the delta, most of the correlations cause the uncertainties drop to drop out. What we're interested in is the deltas. And as long as the uncertainties are roughly, roughly, if we, as long as we can convince ourselves that they're roughly correlated, uh, we don't worry about them. We look at the deltas and we assume the, the uncertainties are small. That's the short answer. Bill. Yeah. Um, one of the topics that we had a presentation on was the problems with mining and finding the minerals that are needed for the renewable in industry. Have, have, has EIA looked at that and have you considered that in your models? Yes. Uh, and substitute mining with water, substitute it with land use, substitute it with uh, a lot of other things that are outside the energy sector, strictly speaking. Um, and with all of them, we try as hard as we can to treat them as input cost curves and nothing more, even though we could do better. And the reason we do that is because those usually, from a jurisdictional standpoint, reside with somebody else. Land use resides with uh, ag. Uh, and they have sophisticated models of land use. Water consumption uh, is you know, interior, and they have all these you know, hydrological models that are really sophisticated, or, or USGS um, hydro models. Um, we can't compete with them. We also don't have their budgets. We have a hard enough time with the budget we have just covering energy, just energy, like it's a small thing. Uh, the entire energy spectrum, uh, US and international, that's a huge remit. Because of that, we have to draw the boundaries around the energy system, and everything that's outside it, we have to just be ruthless and say, we're not doing it, we're not treating it. If you can give us a cost function, a cost curve, we'll put that in. Um, otherwise, we, we just can't do it. Yeah, Bruce Fuller with Argus. Um, since I know you don't forecast the impact of change, but one that's coming up, IMO 2020 in the next three months. Yeah. Um, are you beginning to take a look or speculative, or is this something in your guys' remit for next year? Yeah, no, no, that's a great question. What's going to impact those changes and what yeah. those are going to look like? So IMO is, uh, is a current law and, and, and regulation, so that's in, right? So it's in uh, AEO 2019 that we published in January. It's also implicitly in the IMO that I just showed here. Um, uh, what I didn't tell you is that we do do a forecast. It's not this, but we do have a forecast. It's called the Short-Term Energy Outlook, the STEO. That one goes out 13 to 24 months. It's a weird window. Um, it goes out to December of next year. So 13 to 24 months. And that one is a proper forecast. That one's our best guess of what's actually going to happen. In that one, IMO is absolutely in it because we expect IMO to come in. So we have written about IMO and the impact of IMO in several different products. Um, the short answer is Google is your friend. <laughs> site colon www.eia.gov and search for IMO. You'll find all kinds of material. If you can't find it, let me know. I'll send you some things. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Hi, David. Uh, George Fibby from Baker Bots. Right. Um, one question about the blank check on information gathering. Right. Is there any data that you don't have that you would like to have? Oh, and what is yes. it? Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. <laughs> Ask a modeler that question. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, unfortunately, the data that I would like to have is unknowable. I would love to know how consumers will change. I would love to know how they would change. Oops. Uh, 
Um, I would like to know how consumer preferences would change. Um, I would like to know a lot of international data that's just un inaccessible because it's outside of our mandate. We can't collect data outside the U.S. We can collect data inside the U.S. Um, <coughs> the data that we collect and republish, the best we can do is say this is an example for others to follow. Uh, a lot of other countries have their own data collection agencies. They come to us all the time and they ask us, how do we set up, how do we set up something like you know, uh, name your country EIA? Uh, we get that question all the time. And the answer every single time is, we'll get your Congress to write you two gigantic blank checks. Um, <laughs> and that's usually the problem. They can't. They don't have the, the authority to do that the way, the way that we do. Uh, China comes to us every five or six years and asks us to help them set up a Chinese EIA. Uh, we, we work very closely. We talk to all these people all the time. We talk to the, you know, Canada, what used to be called NEB and is now called something else, um, that does the Canadian uh, outlook. We coordinate with them. We understand what they're talking about. We talk to them about what we understand about their, their world. We did a really fascinating study, actually, speaking of Canada, Canada and Mexico. We got together, we had a trilateral work uh, we did together with them. We sat in a room and we compared outlooks, and our outlooks were wa vastly different. And we said, okay, well, let's do kind of like a model in a comparison exercise where we take the similar assumptions wherever we can, and the similar assumptions were basically oil price and gas price, uh, and then run our own models and see how they come out. And we came up with vastly different answers. I think Canada, at the same Henry Hub prices, we wanted to import four BCF a day of Canadian gas. They wanted to export 16. Huh, okay, well, that's something. Uh, and it turned out we found the problem. The problem was a lag. We had a data lag. We were looking at their most recently published outlook to get it to inform our opinion of Canada. They were in turn looking at our most recently published outlook to get, and this was in the time when shale was taking off, going exponentially. So if you're lagging by a year or two, you know, their recent, most recent outlook was based on data, uh, based on an analysis they'd done the previous year, based on data they collected the previous year. It was two years lagged data by the time we got it, and it was hopelessly uh, out of date. So we had a very um, uh, uh, systematically conservative view of each other's resources. Uh, and once we discovered that, we're like, okay, we can solve this. The, prob the way to solve this is to actually talk to each other, it turns out. Uh, so that's what we did. That was our solution. Well, why don't we just talk to each other and work this out? And it turned out it worked b brilliantly. So. Excellent. Everybody join me in thanking David. That's fantastic. Thank you. Well, um, remarkably, we're basically right on schedule. Um, so I'm happy to say that. I'm not going to belabor um, standing in the way of you in a cocktail outside. Hopefully everybody can join for at least one uh, and talk about the, the day's events. But I think, um, again, this event proved to be very insightful. Um, a lot of useful information was, was shared by multiple parties from different parts of the value chain across the energy space, a lot of different perspectives, which I think highlights really the uncertainty that exists as we move forward. Um, but the one thing that is certainly true, regardless of all that uncertainty, is things are changing. Um, the pace of change, the degree of change, the industries that will feel those the most, uh, those are, in a lot of ways, hindsight exercises. We can look back and we know that with certainty, but as we stand here today and look towards 2030, which is a famous sort of time point for some reason everybody wants to talk about right now, um, that there's a lot of uncertainty about it. Um, and what we have to understand is that there are different pathways to achieving a particular outcome. I think that really was highlighted uh, in the discussion that we just had. Uh, a lot of questions about why don't you do X or why don't you do Y. Um, in point of fact, it's, it's hard to assume a policy pathway when none has actually been enacted. So we can construct a thousand different types of scenarios, but from the standpoint of a modeler, how do I know I constructed the one that you want to see? Um, that's actually not an easy thing to do. So um, I encourage all of you to continue to engage in this kind of a discussion because it is informative. Um, not only for people who are actually looking at markets and how they will change, but also for policymakers. I know we're certainly going to do our part here at the Baker Institute. Um, and uh, I just want to close by again thanking Baker Botts uh, for this, this fantastic opportunity and partnership. Uh, and thanking all of you for being here. Uh, so with that, we're closed for the day. Please join us outside for a drink. <laughs>